Well, I've been fair to them, so <laughs> I will get going. So welcome to everybody to uh, my talk, Where's All the Wildlife? Summer Flooding and the Importance of Landscape Conservation. It's so great to see so many of you joining us here today for the Open Day. It's obviously a special celebration for us here. Um, I've obviously got it's quite a lot encompassed within this title, and I am going to try and pile through as much information as I can in the next three quarters of an hour and I will try and allow time for questions because there's obviously a few of you like myself that are going to join Jocelyn on the walk ready for three o'clock so we'll have to be quite sharp. Um, so just to sort of set the framework, um, floodplains are amongst the most biologically productive uh, ecosystems on earth and some of you may not be clear what an ecosystem is. Uh, and first of all, you must know what a community is. So a community is basically a series of different species residing in the same area. And an ecosystem is the interaction between the communities and their non-living environment, so effectively the weather. Um, so that's what we mean by ecosystem. And under the uh, framework of floodplains, we have a whole array of different habitat types from ponds right through to fens and lakes. Um, and to emphasize the importance uh, of these floodplains, it's worth noting that 43% of all endangered bird species actually reside within these wetland areas. And 47% of higher plants uh, reside uh, within floodplains also. And importantly, they have a multifunctional value for us. Um, and it's been calculated that they actually contribute up to 40% of global annual renewable ecosystem services. Now, some of you may be wondering, what's ecosystem services? So ecosystem services are effectively the benefits we as humans gain from our natural environment. It's as simple as that. So just to give you some examples of what wetlands can offer us, um, they provide the habitat which supports the diversity of species um, and they provide raw materials and raw resources like fresh water, for example. So fresh water is one of our rarest resources. It's only 2.9% of all water is fresh water. So the uh, fresh water that's held within these habitats um, is extremely precious to us. And also, they have a function to store carbon, especially in areas where there's high peat content uh, as well. And a recent study actually showed that if 5% of the peat in the UK w allowed the carbon to be released, that would equate to a whole year of greenhouse gas release uh, within the UK, which is phenomenal and again shows their importance on a global scale. Um, there is also the water regulation, sort of the water treatment effect, filtration effect through these um, habitats. And importantly, what we're going to focus on today is the flood abatement, um, the water regulation aspect of the wetlands. So to bring this closer back to home, uh, I want to frame most of this talk very locally. I'm sure many of you come from the local area. Um, this green light configuration is known as the Upper Thames floodplain. <coughs> and um, we're currently nestled just in this U bend here in the centre of town. And for those of you coming on the walk this afternoon, we're going to be heading into, into the floodplain down on Port Meadow. Now, I, uh, I want to first emphasise that these floodplain areas um, are actually characterised by the winter flooding. For those of you who live locally, you're bound to have gone down to Port Meadow during the winter period when it has been flooded. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the natural exchange of nutrients in these systems. And it's obviously occurring during the dormant stage of these systems, so not during the reproductive period. Now, I want to concentrate on one particular area within this tributary, which is nestled down here on the west wing, and it's a site called Chimney Meadows Nature Reserve. And it belongs to the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. And it covers about 250 hectares, or just over now, because they've extended into a further field. Um, and one particular community that resides in this area, the floodplain meadow, I want to focus down on that first of all. Um, and under the National Vegetation Classification, 
Um, some of you may not know what the National Vegetation Classification was, but effectively it was a project carried out in the early 1990s by Professor Rodwell, and it was an incredible undertaking. Him and his team set out to classify all of our habitat communities as a way of, <coughs> excuse me, of focusing down our conservation efforts. And um, he came up with a, with a series of habitat classifications. And um, the floodplain meadows ended up being a mesotrophic grassland four. So that's classified by the fox, meadow foxtail and greater burnet grassland. Now this grassland is extremely rare in the UK. It, co it covers only 1,500 hectares. So it's extremely rare. And one thing that you'll notice from the photograph is how fantastically dense it is and, and structurally complex. Mm -hmm. So this sort of speckling in the foreground, some of you may recognize as Brisa media, so the quaking grass, um, which is quite a specialist of old hay meadows. Um, and these species-rich meadows can contain uh, roughly, usually, uh, over 20 species per square meter. Um, and this structural complexity is extremely important for the reasons I'm about to explain. So on the left-hand side, we have a representation of a very simple, single structured sward. And as you can see, there's very little um, sort of dy dynamism in, in this structure. And, uh, and it supports only a few high level species. Whereas if you look at the uh, example on the right hand side, there's much more structural diversity and it's much more species rich. And you can see that it offers many more different areas, which we call niches. Um, to host a whole array of higher level species. So why is having better biodiversity important? Um, now this is a, a simple diagram of a food chain. And a food chain is simply the way that energy is passed between species. So in this lower section of the food chain, we have the primary producers that capture the sunlight, produce the food through photosynthesis, um, and that energy is passed up to the primary consumers, um, and um, which gain their energy directly from the primary producers. So this is a very, very simple food chain. It's only got two levels. Um, and the black bars represent the numbers of each of the species. Now, these very simple food chains are extremely susceptible to stochastic events, including um, events like flooding. Now, by having diversity in the grassland sward, and here I'm contrasting just plain grassland species to a mixed, a much more sort of species rich mixture. This is on arable land. <coughs> and you can see simply the difference in the complexity of the food chains. You don't obviously have to, <laughs> to try and work out any of these connections. It's just simply, this is a very simple food chain and this is a very complex one. And obviously you want to ask yourself, why is that important? Um, now, the insurance hypothesis basically suggests that the higher the level of biodiversity that we have, the more that that basically protects us against um, potential stochastic events in the future, environmental change. And the reason that is, is because the more biodiversity you have, the more likely you will have species within that diversity that can adapt or are adapted to any particular environmental circumstance you wish to throw at them, whether it's flooding or increased temperatures. So if we allow this animation to continue, and you'll start seeing some of the primary producers disappearing, by the time we get to the white clover, which obviously was quite a large component of the primary producers, once that is lost, you can see the devastating effect it has on the higher level species. And um, that just emphasizes uh, the importance of complexity, which you will need to think about as, as we go through the rest of the talk. So there are two erroneous beliefs about flooding, which I'd also like to squash during this, uh, this talk today. Um, the first, and you will read this in, in some publications, that all flooding have environmental benefits, and that's just simply not the case, and I will be demonstrating that with the data um, I will be showing you. So first of all, the floodplain meadow communities that uh, I've mentioned, um, they are extremely vulnerable, 
vulnerable to changes in water regime, nutrient regime, and they require very specialist vegetation management. So this balance um, is essential. Now, in terms of the hydrological requirements, um, there are the eco-hydrological guidelines uh, for plant communities, which is generated through the Open University research work uh, and available freely online if any of you are doing any management work yourselves. Um, and this diagram just simply demonstrates across the months of the year what the ideal water level is for this community, for the floodplain meadow community, um, below the, the surface level. So there is a general preference, obviously, for there to be no water above the surface level. So when the water hit in 2007, so this is a photograph from Chimney Meadows in the first flood in July, um, and we were hit again in 2008. But you can see, obviously from leaves on the tree, this is the peak of the reproductive period. So this had devastating knock-on effects for the species on this site. And the examples that I'll be giving you today, they ricochet and were very similar across the same sites all the way up the Thames. So to start with some of the botanics, um, the first impacts we were noticed because I was carrying out uh, various quadrat survey work and we noticed uh, a devastating drop of over 60% loss of the coverage of the key species which um, make it uh, a floodplain meadow. So this is not a 60% drop of all species. What we're interested in is the species that make it a floodplain meadow. Um, and um, across th these arrows are representing the 2007 and 2008 flooding. So that is a huge devastating impact. And it's not surprising that it was that devastating because when the flooding hit in July, much of the seed had already dropped from the vegetation. So much of the seed was actually washed out into the riverine systems. Um, and that is why in the following year, um, the resurgence of these species is so low, and I'm going to go into more detail about that uh, in a bit later on. So the second uh, aspect that they are extremely sensitive to is the nutrient regime, and specifically with the species-rich meadows, they require very low levels of phosphorus. So that's what we're going to be concentrating on. And you can see from the green section on this map that it's generally between 0 and 1 grams per metre squared is the acceptable level for this uh, community. Now, this devastating photo was taken in the aftermath of the flooding. So once the water had receded, much later in the summer, we were left with this kind of snow-white algal scum. I mean, it had such a strong algal smell. It really felt like you were at the seaside or something. It was quite surreal. Um, but um, because the water had been so warm throughout the summer period, um, this algal bloom had developed, and of course, this leaves behind it an extremely nutrient-rich um, algal scum. And um, the impacts of this deposition was actually monitored by Professor Going, uh, who managed to get an urgent um, grant to assess the phosphorus deposition um, all the way across from the Severn, which, as you all know, was badly affected right through across to the far end of the Thames. And Chimney Meadows was one of the sites that was actually monitored. And it was found that the phosphorus levels had been increased fourfold above what it would normally be. And this is extremely disconcerting because phosphorus, if you're trying to manage a site and you're trying to reduce the phosphorus levels, even if you remove the hay, you can only reduce the phosphorus by about 1% each year. So when you look at the scale of at the seven and you imagine how long it's going to take them to get those sites back into condition, it's quite a scary thought at the very least. Um, so the third main variable which affects these meadow areas is the vegetation management. So they require preferably an annual hay cut in July, August time um, and followed by um, grazing by preferably cattle. And um, unfortunately, because of this algal scum that had developed, 
Um, this had obviously impeded any ability to hay cut or any ability to graze. And in fact, that was the case for over two years of the, uh, of the site um, in terms of the management. And so not only did you have the algal scum build up, but you also had all of this organic matter building up as well, um, which obviously had implications for the competitive plants trying to burst back through. It was um, extremely devastating, and, um, and that was again reflected in the number of species emerging post-flooding. So again, this is 2007, 2008, and there was an over 50% drop-off in the species uh, emerging um, between before and after the flooding. And again, not only is it because the seas were washed into the riverine systems, but it's also because of this huge mat, which was really impenetrable for many of the less competitive species. So the second uh, erroneous belief about flooding I would like to squash um, is that flooding does not adversely affect the soil macro invertebrate populations. Um, and this is certainly, again, you'll see written uh, in some documentation. Certainly at Chimney Meadows, the data we'd collected from pitfall trapping on the ground beetle and rove beetle data demonstrated an extremely dramatic 85% loss uh, across those species groups um, in, a, so in abundance. That's a huge, huge um, impact. And if you think back to those original food chains that I showed you, you can imagine the knock-on effect for the higher level species um, with a loss. And I'm going to come back to that um, uh, later on. But um, in terms of some of the other species that we, we lost at the site, um, Bumbus ruderarius, some of you may know, is a priority conservation species um, and was nesting down at the National Nature Reserve section of Chimney Meadows, and that was completely lost. So those meadows were under at least a metre and a half of water for many, many weeks, at least eight weeks. Um, and so all those nesting sites were completely destroyed. And sadly, Bombus ruderarius has not returned to that site since. Oh, sorry, it's a type of bumblebee. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. And um, the other key impact in terms of uh, in terms of the invertebrate species was a 63% decline in the worm densities. And this, in alignment with the loss of ground beetles, had an ultimate impact on the number of breeding curlew. So we completely lost the breeding curlew from that site. Um, and no breeding curlew have been recorded at Chimney since, sadly. And of course, that is the key question, is how long will it take for these communities to reassemble? Um, and there's, there's various data looking at uh, worm density, and the data indicated sort of 2.5 metres to 10 metres per year is the migration rate of worms. So. We may be in for quite a long wait with, with some species. And in terms of the beetles, I'm going to show you a specific research project where we looked into this uh, shortly. Um, so in addition, the grasshopper densities crashed by about 80% uh, as well. That was a phenomenal crash. Obviously, they feed on grasses. So all of that, as you saw from the other photographs, was completely destroyed. Um, and I do recall um, moving around the site by boat to check various areas and being inundated, all these various grasshoppers just jumping into the boat because they had obviously moved up to the scrub areas and the trees, but sadly had nowhere else to go. There was nothing to feed on. The grass had been destroyed. And so many of these either died of starvation or obviously picked off by predators, or we found very commonly they were attacked by fungal infections uh, and uh, passed away that way. So that's why, although they may have initially survived the flooding, um, we ultimately had a loss of about 80%. Um, and uh, interestingly, in terms of the barn owl densities, we saw a 50% drop off of them, not 100%. Um, and the reason was, in some of these high level meadows um, remained out of the water. And what we think is obviously a lot of the small mammal populations were pushed into this area. So effectively, it just became this fantastically dense larder for, for, the, uh, for the barn owls. 
But sadly, we did lose um, those breeding uh, birds that were down on the lower section because on the island, for instance, let me just jump to the next slide. Um, this is just simply demonstrating the topography of the island. Uh, so you've got the Thames proper coming around the outside, and this is the Thames Cut that was put in 1890. And this raised section here is effectively all the soil that they dumped out to the side. So within 100 metres of the cut, effectively, the wood mice and field mice, they survived in that area. Um, but in this whole section here, this was completely inundated, and all of those populations were lost. And I know this because I had a master's student working on those very populations at the time. And so she was able to, to see that there was some survival rate on the island, but not enough to sustain. There was a bar now that had been nesting in the ash tree here. Um, so, so a massive impact across the site. Obviously, I haven't gone through all of the different species, but we don't uh, have time uh, today. Um, but I just wanted to give you a taster of some of the, the impacts. And this is the key question, because in terms of where we go from here, in terms of adaptive management into the future, if the prediction is for increased risk of flooding and especially more intense events, potentially during the summer period, the question is that if it takes 10 years for these communities to re-establish, let's say, and yet these events may occur every 10 years, then how viable are these habitats as we move forward in the future? And, and it's a very important question, especially for site managers and how, how they're going to deal with that. So what are the potential solutions? And, um, and what are the recovery rates? Well, the invertebrate surveys are being repeated next year, so I won't have the data for you on that right now. But in terms of the botanics, um, over a four-year period, uh, the recovery was still only two-thirds of the original coverage of those key species for that community, which in some ways seems quite positive, actually. But when you look at the next graph and you actually look at the number of species rather than just the coverage of that community, well, it's an absolute fraction of that. And that's the issue. So what's happened is that there have been a few more dominant, maybe more competitive species amongst those key species that have literally spread out and have become very dominant in the grassland. Um, but the whole complement is far from there. And as you can see, there's uh, in, that in four years, there's just this tiny fractional recovery compared to the original coverage of, of these key species. So it's definitely food for thought. And of course, the question is, well, if the community can't reside in that specific location, then maybe it can be pushed elsewhere. And so restoration um, and buffering and linking these sites is really going to be the key way to, to move forward. And down at Chimney Meadows, um, an arable reversion process took place, started in 2004, and 70% um, of the higher level grounds, remember the Thames is running along this southern edge here, um, this is our National Nature Reserve and the lower wetland area. So this is where the, the main section of the MG4 resided. Um, and this is where we were recreating um, fresh new meadows as a, a support and as a buffer to, to the National Nature Reserve. And so this was carried out by removing green hay from the National Nature Reserve and spreading it out over these arable fields. And effectively, you know, most of my work was looking at the effectiveness of this man ongoing management and how successful um, this, uh, this restoration project actually was. Um, and in each of the fields, we had a control plot so where no green hay was spread. And um, you can see that within that plot, in the very outset, it was certainly just a mixture of sow thistle and creeping thistle and such like. And it was quite a contrast with the rest of the field, even if you don't, didn't even know what species uh, were in there. And the rest of the field, within 12 months, had a baseline dry neutral grassland community, which itself only has five to 10,000 hectares across the whole country. So that was pretty spectacular to even achieve that in that short space of time. Um, and what, we, what I did was I had contrast plots at the National Nature Reserve. So not only were we able to look 
at uh, how well each of these fields were developing after the management, but how well they were progressing towards our target community, which was where we took the green hay from in the first place, down at the National Nature Reserve. And um, across the first three years, which was obviously pre-flooding, um, you don't need to understand the details of this graph. It's simply that um, across the three years, you have the control that I've mentioned and the treatment. And all this, is, all this is asking is how similar are these sites to the National Nature Reserve where the hay came from. And there was an extremely significant result demonstrating a shift in those arable reversion fields towards the target community across just three years, which was phenomenal. Um, and obviously just in the nick of time because we'd created this baseline and then the flooding hit July 2007. So it is a classic example of why buffers uh, are beneficial because if we hadn't carried out that reversion, that National Nature Reserve would have been basically lost. There was no, there was no buffering at all. The nearest meadow to the National Nature Reserve was at least uh, several miles away. Um, so, you know, but still, even though we'd created that buffer and there was obviously uh, an ability for species to shift up to that area. Ultimately, Timley was still surrounded by an agricultural landscape, and it's still isolated in many ways um, and vulnerable um, to change. So though we've created 70 hectares, yes, they're still vulnerable. Um, and the intensity of the landscape around it um, needs to be dealt with, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that in shortly. I just wanted to sort of revisit the most historical aspect, really, where you know, these sites started from. So um, there were pioneers such as Charles Rothschild back in 1912. They established the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves, and basically they decided that why don't we go out there and find out the best places in the UK to preserve a biodiversity. Um, and it was effectively their work that led to the development of strategic uh, sort of statutory res nature reserves, which we now know as national nature reserves. Um, and the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves became what we would know as the Wildlife Trusts. And so effectively, it set the scene for how conservation was going to move forward at that point. It was very revolutionary in its time. But, um, of course, now... Those sites only cover 10% of the UK. 70% of our land is agriculture. So as fantastic as those sites may be, they are still surrounded by a very intense environment. And especially after the Second World War, when there was obviously a push to increase um, crop production, um, it led to degra degradation and fragmentation of many habitat sites and obviously therefore an increase in the isolation between these sites. And what's important is the fact that the more isolated your sites, you cannot have interchange of species between them. So it means that it's very hard for populations to be viable in the long term. And this is the key point that I now want to pick up. Um, so, oh, that's come out awfully bright. <laughs> um, so this is the Thames tributary again. But all of these little coloured patches um, that are overlaid are either um, statutory reserves or local county wildlife sites or um, local uh, reserves of the RSPB or Wildlife Trust. And the th first thing that should really strike you is how separated a lot of these sites are. Very fragmented across the landscape. Um, particularly, obviously, in the southeast here, it's obviously very built up. So it's not that there's nothing in between here, it's generally probably housing um, and such like. So, uh, of course, the issue is even if, so this is chimney again, even if you do extend the existing sites, the issue is the gaps between these sites may still be too large for many species to be able to cross. Um, and it's thinking about this sort of wider matrix, which is, is a real fundamental uh, focus I in ecology right now um, and thinking about how to move forward with conservation because many sites uh, and many species sorry um, are able to either fly in if so obviously birds some are able to balloon in some spiders can balloon in on silks 
um, and um, some species, Zotter obviously, can, can swim into sites. Um, unfortunately, not all species are so lucky, and some have life harder than others. And um, this is uh, um, the bloody-nosed beetle that some of you might already know, so uh, Tamakotini bricosa. And um, this poor chap has to walk between sites. Um, and so in terms of the linking of the landscape for this particular species, it's a very useful species to be able to look at fragmentation and look at permeability of the landscape. So the data that we collected at Chimney Meadows became part of a much wider study, um, a multi-site uh, landscape study that was led by uh, Ben Woodcock from Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. And effectively what we were asking was, how does the quality of the habitats in the surrounding landscape affect the colonization of these phytophagous beetles? And phytophagous just means they feed on grasses. Um, so, so how does this wider landscape impact? And I can just take, it, take you through this. So this is a graph literally just comparing the restoration success of the plants when we generated our meadows against the restoration success of these beetles. Um, as you can see, the graph is very messy. There's no clear relationship um, at all that's obvious in this graph. Now, there is a theory called the field of dreams, and you've probably all seen that movie. That was, I can't remember when that was, years ago. Um, and effectively, the ideology of that was if you create it, they will come. And some, a lot of people within the conservation area, uh, fair enough, before the evidence came to light, thought that if you created the meadows, the species will come. And of course, in terms of birds, yes, they will come in. London Wetland Centre is a classic example of that. You know, they built that in the b income of the birds. But in terms of these phytophagous beetles that have to walk, um, there's obviously not such a clear relationship. There are barriers occurring that means they can't just suddenly appear when you create a meadow. And so what we looked at was the proportion of species-rich meadows in the surrounding landscape. So how permeable is this landscape? How, how easily can they move between there? So we looked at the proportion of species-rich grass in the landscape against the success of the beetles. And there was uh, a much sharper relationship. There's obviously other variables um, going on, and I won't have time to go into details today, but the much sharper relationship, which is obviously completely logical, because if you're walking through an environment, you need to have the right habitat to walk through. Otherwise, it, it becomes a barrier. So this connectivity um, is an extremely uh, vital property of the landscape. And especially in the light of climate change, species will need to be able to move between sites. Habitats will need to be able to shift as we extend sites and create buffers. Um, I mean, many people think that species will always have to sort of be shifting northwards, but when you think about, say, a hillside, um, some species that reside on, say, the southern face could actually, instead of moving 100 kilometres north to get a degree drop, can actually just move up 130 metres. I know we don't have many of those in, the, in Oxfordshire, but <laughs> we have some up. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's about adapting your management to, to allow these shifts. Um, now, the original ideology of having single sites and, and managing them <coughs> has been completely revolutionised. And um, these new approaches, these landscape approaches, are being led by organisations like the Wildlife Trust. Um, and they have a national programme called the Living Landscapes, which effectively aims to restore, recreate and reconnect, which is exactly everything that we've been talking through so far. Um, and they're doing that by um, connecting and partnershiping with local communities, um, with schools, with businesses, and importantly, the landowners. Because as I've already mentioned, 70% of our land is agriculture. And it's absolutely vital that these landowners are on board if we are to develop this connectivity and linkage. Now, a lot of the government schemes, like the higher level schemes, entry level schemes, financially support these sorts of management. So if a farmer wants to undertake uh, hedgerow management, potentially plant a hedgerow to link two fields, or potentially to uh, enhance a river system to allow more permeability, then there is a financial support. 
um, which is incredible. So, um, so this this direction is is opening out. Loads of other organisations are obviously involved now. Also, this is an example of one of the living landscapes um, in Berkshire, just over the border. Uh, if you have chance, you should go down and and visit the. The Wildlife Trust are hopefully literally about to sign to take over um, the, the council sites as well, which is absolutely incredible to add to, to the living landscape. Um, and it, I mean, what's what I like about the Berkshire living landscape is it emphasises the fact that it's not about creating just an open space of countryside. It's about allowing that interchange between the built up areas and, um, and these greener areas. As, you, as we go on the walk, those of you that are joining us, we will be talking about um, urban ecology and the potential sympathetic management that people can do in their own gardens to enhance this landscape linking, whether it's planting, you know, planting their own meadows or creating ponds and such like. It allows those stepping stones for species, even if they can't necessarily breed in your garden, they might use you as a stepping stone to somewhere that they can. Um, and that is extremely crucial. And all of this movement is backed up with the scientific literature. Um, there's loads of freely available um, evidence-based reviews, which you, you can look if you want to, to read further about this. Um, so in basically supporting the en enhancement and connectivity approach. And some of you may remember there was a government white paper that came out back in 2010, um, and John Lawton, um, wrote, the, it was titled, Making Space for Nature. And effectively, he was iterating what the Wildlife Trust and other organizations are effectively doing, um, which is um, enlarging current sites and joining them together. But it's, it's bringing everything together now. That, you know, there's the scientific evidence that this is required. Um, there is the government support as well in terms of funding for the, the landowners and such like as well. And then there's the onus from the NGO sector. So just to very quickly to close, just to bring it back to a local perspective, um, I just wanted to sort of highlight um, the Thames catchment flood management plan area. Um, obviously, we're just in, in Oxfordshire here. And I wanted to highlight something that you, I don't know if any of you have actually read the plan, um, but um, one of the, the quotes states, uh, we will identify locations where the storage of water would benefit communities by reducing flood risk and providing environmental benefits by increasing the frequency of flooding. Now, after everything I have just said, <laughs> I hope that you completely disagree with that statement. Um, and the evidence is completely to the contrary. Now, unfortunately, one of their current proposed storage sites sits right on top of this very site I've just been talking about. So you can recognize the outline here of Chimney Meadows. Now, these storage areas, they are proposing as a last case scenario. This is potentially 50 years, 70 years down the line. But I am very thankful uh, to say that it's not just their main focus. I mean, obviously, if, if flood storage becomes your main driver, then how are you going to control these conditions if potentially they could store water at any time of year whenever these catastrophic events happen? Those, those communities would be completely lost. Um, and it's fantastic to say that the Environment Agency are committed to trying to push forward with a natural flood management scheme. So those flood storage areas are a last resort. The focus really is to try and slow the water down in a much more uh, subtle effect. I'll just show you some photographs in a second. Encourage, we call infiltration. So I know that um, in the Netherlands, they have these what are called like green waterways, like grassed waterways, which are at the base of fields. And it means when there's a flash event, it will quickly take the water through without cutting across all of the agricultural site, which would whip a lot of soil and nutrients across with it. So there are um, ways and means, um, you know, planting forestry within sort of cut throughs where big water surges can happen as well. That's taking place. And obviously, this supports the natural processes and ecosystems. We don't want massive engineering anymore. It's, it's not going to allow that natural connectivity and all these vital ecosystem services to take place. Um, so this is an example of these kind of 
softer, sort of integrated wetland features. Um, these are a series of scrapes um, and ponds that, uh, that uh, have been set up down at Chimney Meadows. And again, these are supported by these government schemes. Um, so many farmers that I know locally have also created their own series of scrapes and such like to help with the landscape linkage. Um, and so I just threw this photograph up just because it uh, brings us back down closer to homes. Obviously we're going to, for those of you coming on the walk, uh, we'll be going down to, to Port Meadow, which is just right within this um, floodplain area. So I just wanted to say uh, thanks to obviously uh, the Wildlife Trust and uh, Ben Woodcock from CEH and uh, Professor Going from the Open University. So thank you very much. And I, I just I kind of left five minutes so that we can have some questions and discussion because <coughs> I'm particularly interested in your take on flood storage and if you've got any personal experiences uh, of this process or anything. So I will open up to the floor. Are there any schemes to scoop up beetles from one site and transport them to another site? There's not at the moment. The current scientific evidence it really doesn't support translocation of beetles. It's not effective enough. And various methods have been contrasted from sort of taking turf cutting um, and translocating that across. Um, and they have not been effective. And they've been done on quite large scales as well. So um, although there's some evidence for other species obviously being translocated, particularly sections of grassland itself and taken across, um, but, yeah, the, the evidence is not there um, unless it just hasn't been done on a large enough scale. And then, of course, it comes down to the cost issue uh, invariably. Um, but, no, translocation doesn't seem to work. Um, I mean, obviously, you have to make sure you have the right conditions for those species and the right habitat. So unless you literally translocate the whole thing itself, which costs a huge amount of money, yeah, at the moment, that's very difficult. So, yeah. um, The community, I think, um, defined by... Burnet. How do you actually pick which plants define the community? Well, that's where John Rodwell's work came in. Yeah. So, so they, the phenomenal piece of work they did at the early 1990s, they basically did a fun, like, over 2,000 quadrats um, and basically compared the content and effectively were able to petition out and say, well, these are all very similar, they contain these constant species, these are very similar, they contain these constant species, and then they put labels to them. So it's, it's, and they just noted that there were dominant, those two species were quite dominant. What's interesting is at Chimney, we never had Greater Burnet. Right. Um, and what they recognize now, and the Floodplain Partnership, um, which is a fantastic organization, are at the moment looking into sub-communities. Uh, of course, one could argue that as climate changes, of course, those original classifications are going to completely shift, which is very unfortunate given the phenomenal piece of work that that was back in its day. But that's just a reality. So there is, the, there is the question of when you have these target communities, so what does that mean anymore? Because if, if, if the species content is going to shift because they have, some have to potentially be more tolerant to flooding events, then yes, those we, ha we have to be very careful within the conservation field not to just say we want it to be um, you know, MG6 or MG7 and such like. For, for that reason, really, there's got to be some flexibility. That National Nature Reserve was more of a crossover between MG4 and MG5, which is the floodplain meadow and the dry neutral grassland. So both, but both, you know, rare, but um, they are sort of loose classifications. There's always, as we're recognizing, the flexibility in those communities. And of course, as some communities have been wiped out by flooding, the species that recolonize are not necessarily the same species. Um, and in terms of ecosystem services, one could argue, well, it doesn't have to be a specific species that does that job as long as somebody does it. So, um, so in, terms of, in terms of our human benefits, as long as our species uh, colonizes that can break down that uh, feces, then why does it matter if it's one and not the other? I mean, that's a very, very <laughs> basic level of looking at it. But it's, you know, that's why you know, communities are very, very different. So if you look at one MG4 grassland and look at the beetles contained within that and look at it in a completely different area, yes, there are similarities, but they're never exactly the same. You know, ecosystem is stable. 
um, they're always fluxing because they're responding to different environments in different areas. So, but it's a r it is a really it's a good question. It's a, it's a really interesting dilemma that everybody has, especially as we move forward now. So, sorry, got two questions here. Um, were the orchids, particularly the green leaf, uh, affected by the flooding, yeah. and have they recovered since then? I remember seeing them. Yes, that's before. right. They were. Yeah. That's right, because you yeah. came down with the group. Um, and um, they were there. They have not been seen since, sadly. Yeah. So um, I did. So Lisa Lane is now managing the site, and um, and yes, they said that they haven't seen them this year. So, but we hold out hope that they they may return in time. Again, some of the species may be there, but the conditions might not be right to emerge yet. So, yeah. but um, but they had a good population down there. It was it was excellent. The fritillaries, interestingly have emerged in great glory. <laughs> we only ever had a few plants, and they've obviously gone wild because because the uh, the, the air is so moist that they've um, they've done exceptionally well. So, although the green wings have, have sort of gone dormant for a while, the the fritillaries have come through in great strength. So, yeah, and it's quite interesting. Yeah. Sorry, there's a question. Well, just a very quick question about habitat management, not specific mm -hmm. to flood floodplain, but you mentioned uh, aftermath grazing. Horses and sheep together is better than just horses. I mean, thinking of the evidence base, and just while I'm talking about the evidence base, actually, if you go to uh, conservationevidence.com, there is a build-up of freely available uh, evidence. So I would suggest you look at that, and environmentalevidence.com as well. So those two sites is basically a way, because obviously we, it's recognised that not everyone has access to the scientific data and can say what is effective and what's not. And so the idea in these sites and particularly the conservation evidence site, they're trying to build up a series of synopses which says, you know, what's the best management for birds? What's the best management for, you know, X, Y, and Z? And it's fantastic, and they're hoping to review them every two years, and it will be a great way for site managers to be able to access this exact kind of information. So, yeah, the, the best is cattle, just because they, the way that they graze, it creates a much more dynamic sward structure, which, again, allows for that complexity and therefore enhances the biodiversity. Sheep graze very uniformly, and that's why you would only use them. So the reversion that we carried out, um, because you start with a very open root system, you definitely don't want cattle or horses on at that stage, because they would just destroy the root system. So it depends on the sort of level of your management. So in those early stages, because the root system was so open, we had to use sheep because they're much lighter footed. And then after the first four or five years, once the root system had closed over, then we brought in the cattle to start generating this fantastic variation. Um, so it, you have to tailor it to, to what you're actually undertaking. But horses on their own have not been demonstrated because they leave huge sections. It's not like cattle where they have like nice mixed tussocks. Um, because of this defecation and urination, they won't go <laughs> really anywhere near it so that you get whole sections. Because I had tried to use ponies in the past, and it only worked when I alternated ponies and sheep within the same area to get the mix ultimately. So, so, and also you've got the whole helminthics effect on uh, invertebrates as well, and that's a whole different story, but that is an issue if they're defecating within the field. It could impact on your invertebrate population, depending on with this treatment for worms, basically, and, and, and other, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, you, so you've been trying to manage a site. Well, I think the difficulty is, of course, actually getting hold of about how many sheep in uh, parts of Oxford. Yeah, but it's worthwhile contacting the local wildlife trust yeah. because as part yeah. of the living landscape programs, it might be that because they have their own sheep as, and, and yeah. cattle and yeah. such that as well, it's always worth asking. Yeah. Because um, yeah. if it's a way of enhancing the management of the whole landscape, then that's what the living landscape programs all about. So I would definitely yeah. approach them. Yeah. So fantastic. Well, I've gone five minutes over time. I said it wouldn't, but <laughs> I'm kind of aware we've all got to dash and, and go meet Jocelyn and such like. So thanks ever so much for coming. And, uh,